French President Emmanuel Macron won re-election for a second term, defeating Marine Le Pen, according to projections. The win has not been certified yet, although we expect it to be. According to reporting from The Hill, during Le Pen's campaign, she pledged to lessen French ties with the 27-nation EU, the NATO military alliance, and Germany, all of which could have rocked Europe's, quote, security architecture. Macron won by 58.55% to 41.45%. Macron, the first sitting president in 20 years to be re-elected, told supporters that he will be a, quote, president for all. The French election is not the only one we should be focusing on these days. According to Reuters, Slovenia's populist prime minister, Janez Janša, lost a national election on Sunday as the environmentalist Freedom Movement Party won more votes than his SDS party. Janša was hoping to win a fourth term in office. I have no idea if I am pronouncing that correctly. As somebody who has a, a name with a J in it <laughs> myself, <laughs> it really goes either way. Uh, but what are you guys' thoughts on on uh, what happened in France and what happened in Slovenia sort of at the same time, um, all of this playing out together. Well, first of all, in Slovenia, what's really interesting about this is that the Slovenians had been protesting uh, Janez, Jansa. Again, I don't know exactly how to say his name either, <laughs> but they had been they had been protesting him actually for quite some time. He had been in power, I believe, starting in 2004 uh, for a stint and then again in 2012. When he was reelected for a third term, the Slovenian people were really upset about it, actually, went to the streets, large protests broke out. This was right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, he has then instituted quite a few really heavy handed COVID restrictions, um, very limited movement, vaccine passports, vaccine mandates for a lot of the people. So uh, this is not a, a real surprising move. What, it, what I do take uh, some issue with is the characterization of him as populist. I, I don't think that's accurate of him at all for Slovenia. I think he is a neoliberal. When you look at all of his policies, very neoliberal, marched Slovenia into the EU, uh, also took them into NATO, did a lot of globalization sort of expansion, and the people started to uprise against that. So the only reason why they call him a populist is because he seemed to like, you know, he saw the writing on the wall, I think, in Slovenia and the, the populist movement. He sort of started to adopt some of the language saying like, ah, deep state, drain the swamp, fake news, you know, kind of. But I, his policies are very neoliberal. But I, I thought that was kind of interesting with Slovenia that they but, you know, what was interesting about them was rather than getting rid of neoliberal for more right wing, they went more left, mm. which uh, some countries are doing. You know, we're seeing that in South America in particular, but I found that most interesting about Slovenia's election. Ryan, it is true that the sort of populist label, I mean, it's it's always difficult domestically, but when you try to apply it on an international stage with any sense of consistency, it's odd to sort of look at the Macron-Le Pen matchup and try to graft the sort of American dynamic onto it. Right, and, and populism is such an amorphous term Right. That it's, it's relative it, by and definition. And it's totally relative. And yeah. what will often happen is if, like Kim said, if some if somebody checks like one or two of, of the populist boxes, then they'll just call them populist. Yeah. Right. Even though you can have so many boxes within populism that they become completely self-contradictory right. by the end of it. And so like some people call Le Pen a populist. Right. And, uh, right. Because she's got some, you know. Anti-immigration, you know, there's plenty of things that you could say. Well, this some populists are anti-immigration. She's anti-immigration, therefore she's populist. Like, yeah, I mean, I don't know, not really, no, right, not quite. Uh, you know, and you know, she she descends from this kind of her her father was like a, a very well-known, very far-right uh, politician. She's actually probably to the left of her where her father was. Certainly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but still in that tradition, and Macron very much linked her to that tradition, which isn't hard since it's her dad. No. Like if, right. <laughs> if it was like some some slightly more attenuated connection, she she would have been able to distance herself better than than. But her name is Le Pen, and mm -hmm. he's a Le Pen. And well, so, and on, yeah. on austerity questions too, right? Like mm -hmm. this is is a totally different dynamic right. uh, in France than mm -hmm. it is here when you're talking about populism and right versus left. Right. Right, the far right over there is like trying to like lower the retirement age and shower more benefits. Which, if if our right wing moves in that direction, all right, since they're going to be hegemonic for a while anyway, 
<laughs> at least hopefully we can get some public yeah. goodies out of it. Oh. I'm going to be I'm going to be really interesting to, interested to see the exit polls for that French election. Who voted for Le Pen versus who voted for Macron? Uh, because you know I, I'm curious how many of the minorities and those who are of the working class voted for Le Pen. And I would actually be I wouldn't be surprised if it was quite a few, even though she is characterized as a sort of uh, ultra nationalist anti immigration. And she does have a bit of that. But I'm curious on the exit polls. One thing also with France that's interesting is that uh, this was a much closer race than it was in 2017. Emmanuel Macron in 2017 mm -hmm. got 66 percent. Le Pen got 33 percent. So this time this that that gap narrowed and also a lot more people sat out and just chose not to vote for right. either one. People were just not happy with either of their choices this time around. And I think to answer your question, nobody voted for Macron. Like people either voted for Le Pen or voted against Le Pen. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. You, like, like you said, turnout was down, I think, three three ish percent, uh, which is a pretty substantial number in, in France. Uh, and so and and it, turnout was down heavily in a lot of these kind of immigrant communities where you would expect that, you know, just from a surface level, that, that turnout would be way up, coming out to vote against Le Pen. But there's so much anger at Macron that yeah. in, in those communities, you saw this drop off in, in turnout, which I think contributed heavily to the, to the narrowing. And, and that it, it, like the narrowing is significant. You know, the fact that Le Pen was surging leading into the race and like a week ahead of it, people were wondering, might she actually pull this off? then gives us a different perspective and, and it looks like a landslide from that perspective. But like you yeah. said, it's, it's a, it was a much closer race than, than four years earlier. It'd be an interesting hypothetical to run an experiment on what happened in this race, what would have happened in this race absent Putin's invasion of Ukraine, um, because I think that really probably fueled Macron right. a, a good amount. Um, and, yeah. and just a sort of 30,000 foot um, final thought, it, it's that the sort of neoliberal co coalition, as Kim points out, still really doesn't have an, ex an, an answer either here or in Europe to populism um, in the sense that people are, are very opposed or increasingly opposed to these uh, multinational overarching organizations and for very good reasons. And, you know, you, you can come up with, you know, good, you know, populist answers on both sides of the Brexit question uh, that are perfectly reasonable. But the bottom line is there are extremely reasonable complaints about these organizations and about the structure and order that nobody has come up with right. really good responses to. Well, it's still just pretending, you're dismissing it as you know cranks right. and racists instead of really dealing with the questions. Although maybe in Slovenia they figured it out since they voted for the, the environmentalist Greens. freedom yeah. movement, right? Maybe we should look and see what their platform was about. What did they run on exactly? What was their their points and their language and rhetoric, I guess? And and maybe that could be adopted by maybe that could be a lesson learned for I think other Kim, countries. I think Kim just found tomorrow's <laughs> radar. <Excellent>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, we should figure out whether it's a hard J or a, or a soft J <laughs> uh, as, a, as a member of the hard J community. Well, tomorrow on Rising, labor reporter Kim Kelly joins us. Well, not us, but the, the, the weekday Kim. crew uh, reporter joins uh, the show to discuss what the latest unionizing pushes from both Starbucks and Amazon workers means for the labor movement at large. And Rachel Bogard will be here for the Rising panel. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. So you also don't miss Rising Fridays with Ryan and Emily. They do a great job. And our podcast, uh, you can get that anywhere you listen to podcasts. So be sure to subscribe and share that as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Ryan and I are see off to, to chill until Friday. Oh, that's right. <laughs>